Nuclear power was essentially started in 1945, which was an outgrowth of the Manhattan Project in the United States, which of course was war-driven and weapons-driven. And one of the people who was involved in that, Enrico Fermi, who was a professor at the University of Chicago, decided that nuclear physics was far too important to be wasted on weapons, so he built an experimental reactor pile. It delivered, I think, as much about as much as a double-A battery at the time. You know, it was a, it was a, it was a physics experiment. And gradually, a number of experimental reactors began to grow up all over the place. Nobody at that time knew about the risks and the nature of radiation. It was right back in the times when they discovered radium, when you know people like the Curies were tossing it around in the lab and sort of you know holding it in their hands. And then, of course, they all started to die off of various types of malignancies, and gradually they figured out that this wasn't a wise thing to do. And I think in the same vein, that's how people discovered how to handle nuclear materials and how to handle nuclear power and how not to. So there were a certain amount of accidents in the early sort of nuclear days. They knew how to avoid nuclear explosions because that was where the program grew up from. It grew up from the Manhattan Project and they paid a lot of attention how to cause them. And so they figured out how not to cause them in so doing. But they didn't quite know how to optimize them to generate power. So they had basically three types of accidents. The first type of accident was what happened when you didn't keep things cool. Because when if you take a piece of uranium, if I took a slug of uranium right now, a piece of natural uranium, I could walk around with it in my pocket for days and not suffer any of that, because it's not very radioactive. Um, as was the are for emission, which means that if I wrapped it in paper, it wouldn't be able to do anything. Um, if I took that radiation, if I took that piece of uranium and put it into a reactor, and, and it underwent fission, it's a totally different story, because now I've turned it into different materials. I've split it in two, and I've started to produce materials like the usual suspect, cesium-137, iodine-131, strontium-90, and you know, there's a couple of other things I could add to the cocktail, uh, maybe some xenon, some krypton, um, you know, there's lots of things that come out. Cesium is bad because it tends to be ingested generally and it's an alpha emitter and it will, it will do the kind of damage that I told you would happen if you swallowed some of these things. Iodine is bad, it's a beta emitter, but it gets concentrated in the thyroid gland because it replaces the natural iodine, which is not radioactive. Strontium is similar chemically to calcium, so it tends to get absorbed in the bone, and then it kills the bone marrow, which is also not good for you. Um, so these are the sort of the major fragments that come out of fish, and somehow that piece of uranium, which was safe initially, has suddenly been turned into these things, which are not at all safe, and have to be avoided. Uh, xenon, on the other hand, is very safe. It's a chemically inert gas. They even use it in, in lung scans if you go in to get a lung uh, function testing will make you breathe some radioactive xenon, then it'll look at where the rays, where the radiation is coming out from. That's got a very short half-life and it doesn't stay in the body, so once you breathe out, you're basically fine. But uh, Krypton is the same. In fact, Three Mile Island, these were the major things that were released, apart from some hot reactor coolants, radioactive water that had been turned into heavy water by neutron radiation. And Three Mile Island was essentially a, a nothing event except that it showed up a great deal of the weak points of the reactor training and instrumentation. I'll talk a little bit about Three Mile Island in a minute, but I just wanted to emphasize the fact that early on in the 40s, the 50s, and the 60s, there were little things here and there. People generally uh, had a problem with either too much radiation because they, they reached what we call a criticality situation. It won't explode, but you can get a very strong <coughs> flare, what we call a fizzle, a huge amount of radiation all of a sudden and then people get overexposed. So that was the first type of thing that they, they found, and they quickly learned not to do that. Um, they got, I mean, maybe a dozen people were killed in that sort of accident over the, over the three decades. Um, then you got a different type of accident, because if you look at the type of nuclear reactor that we're dealing with, it is like a kettle. It's a, it's a pressure vessel containing steam. The steam is heated by the radioactive decay, by essentially the nuclear fission of the uranium. These are little rods of, re of, of uranium oxide, and there's some control rods inserted in between them to keep control of the neutron flux and the neutron energy. And the whole thing is surrounded by something called a moderator, which is something to slow down the neutrons. The best moderator by far, believe it or not, is water. Um, the Russians use a lot of graphite, which is problematic, as I'll talk about in a minute if we have time. Um, but this is basically a big kettle, and you're, what you're doing is producing steam, and you're putting that steam out to drive a turbine, and then it comes back as condensate as water, so you filter it and you recirculate it. And you have another 
uh, coolant circuit to keep the whole thing cool because there's huge amounts of heat being generated here. Even a tiny amount of nuclear fuel can produce more, more heat than, you know, hundreds of tons of coal. So there's a huge amount of heat density. And most of the problems of nuclear reactors, most of the, the secrets or the protocols for operating them, is basically, number one, managing the neutrons, making sure they go where they're supposed to go with the correct energy to sustain the reaction or to shut it down if it comes to that. And the second one is managing the heat, making sure that the heat comes out of this to drive the turbine and doesn't go on, you know, blowing the lid of the vessel off, which can happen if you're not careful. So really, it's a job of, it's a job of engineering to keep these things going. And that's why you get these large sort of cooling towers to get rid of the excess heat. The, the heat from the steam essentially goes up and goes up into the atmosphere. But there's no radiation coming up into the atmosphere. It's simply the heat of the steam in the secondary circuit. The trouble with these things, however, is that they involve human beings. And human beings, and especially when they work for companies driven by profit, they tend to do things that are very short-term and very much against their ultimate interests. And one of the things that they do, of course, is that they don't spend enough time concentrating on the job. They talk about their homes or their money or their girlfriends or boyfriends or their, you know, sports teams or whatever, instead of keeping their eye on the gauges and keeping, uh, keeping watch on what they're supposed to be watching. And of course, you know, we can't begrudge, we can't expect people to be on all the time, although I believe that robotics should solve a lot of that problem. But basically what happens with these things is if the reactor design is not stable, if it's not controllable, things can go bad very suddenly. And then if people aren't focused on the job, things can get very much worse. Most of the American designs, including the one at Three Mile Island, is a boiling water reactor. It has water as the, as the moderator. The beautiful thing about that is if something happens, the water begins to boil, the moderator goes away. If the moderator goes away, the reaction stops. There is absolutely no way for one of these things to go super critical. There is no way for one of these things to explode in a nuclear fashion, in a boom. It can go bang, however. You can get a steam explosion or a chemical explosion, or you can generate hydrogen off the rods, and then that can explode. And that's bad. But it's certainly not nearly as bad as the, the type of thing that can happen with graphite modulators, which is what the Russians used, and which the Chernobyl reactor in Ukraine used. Um, but essentially, these are kettles. You just have to watch them and make sure they don't boil over. This is a slightly more intricate version of the engineering involved. And there is a lot of engineering, a lot of material science, a lot of corrosion studies. You have to be really careful because there's a huge amount of neutrons flowing in these things. The neutrons change things. They make materials brittle. They make them swell. They make them change chemically. And you have to be ready for that. Control rods are very important. These are rods made of things like boron, which absorb neutrons. They're a neutron poison or a neutron absorber. And whenever anything goes wrong, there's what we call a scram, a very sudden shut down, these things drop into the reactor, immediately absorb all the neutron flux, and then the, nu the, the nuclear reaction stops dead. But just because the nuclear reaction stops doesn't mean that heat stops being generated. There's still a huge amount of heat being generated. Part of it is because of the residue, and part of it is because of the decay heat, because these things are still undergoing slow fission. And that decay heat can go on for months or even years. And that's what has to be managed when the reactor is shut off, and that's what they're having such problems with in Fukushima right now, because they didn't design their cooling systems properly. So it, it's engineering, and, and some people engineer these things better than others. And the American designs tended to be, at least the ones that Westinghouse and, and General Electric produced, tended to be like these kind, of, these kind of steam kettles, these boiling water reactors. The Russians used graphite because they weren't very good at boiling water engineering. And um, well, this is what Three Mile Island ended up looking like. You've got a molten slag down at the bottom because everything got too hot. Three Mile Island, by the way, was this confluence of three or four things, each of which should never have happened. You had initially, they were messing with, actually I shouldn't say they were messing with, they were performing maintenance on the secondary circuits. The secondary circuit is where the steam circulates outside the reactor, so it never touches the core, it never gets radioactive, but it's used to take away the heat from the primary circuit, which is the steam that does go through the reactor. There's a heat exchanger there. And this has to be kept very clean, because you can't have corrosion, you can't have impurities, you can't get the pipes clogged up. And so they have condensate filters and these have to be maintained and cleaned and polished every now and again to make sure nothing happens. And they did this, and as they started doing it, the pumps that were supplying the secondary water shut down. Nobody knows why they shut down, they just went, went out. At that point, the pressure or the temperature, and then therefore the pressure in the primary circuit started to go up. But there's a set of auxiliary pumps that should kick in. The auxiliary pumps kicked in, but someone had valved them out. In other words, they had closed all the valves and the pumps 
so that even though the pumps were running, they couldn't actually push any water through the system. But this was a very, very bad thing to do. You're not ever supposed to valve out all the auxiliary pumps when the reactor is running, because it means you have no backup system at that point. But they did it, and the NRC fried them later for it. They, they should never have done that. So this is the second thing that went wrong. The first thing that went wrong with the pumps. The second thing that went wrong was the, the auxiliary pump valves had been improperly set. And then the third thing that went wrong, there's a relief valve near the top of the reactor. But when the pressure inside builds up to too high a level, it opens up and vents so that this thing doesn't actually explode. And that opened, but then when the excess pressure has been vented, it should close again. And it never closed again, it stuck in the open position. And the guys who were operating the reactor were not, let's just say they weren't the first team. They weren't the best trained, they weren't the best motivated. They were working in the middle of the night, it was about two o'clock in the morning when this happened. And they didn't know what was going on. They didn't recognize that the valve had stuck open. They saw the temperature going up, so they decided to put in more water, which if you thought that was going on, was probably the right thing to do. But they didn't realize that the valve was open. So they put in more water, and of course the water all started pouring out through the open valve. If they had shut the valve, the more water would have gone in, it would have cooled everything down, and nobody would ever have heard of Kingwai Island, because it would, have been, it would have been under control. But this went on for about 16 hours. It went on for the whole duration of these people's shift. And then a new shift came in, saw what was going on, immediately diagnosed the problem correctly, and closed the valve so that the water could actually circulate around the reactor instead of just going out the open valve. But by that time it was too late, because the temperature had already risen, the fuel rods had already buckled, the control rods had already fused into the, into the mechanism, and basically the reactor was dead at that point. Now it was dead, but at the same time, all that had happened was they had vented out 40,000 gallons of coolant water, which wasn't highly radioactive because it didn't spend a lot of time inside the reactor. And they had vented a lot of what turned out to be mildly radioactive steam containing these gases, which, as I pointed out, are the least dangerous of all. I mean, if it had released a lot of this stuff that Chernobyl did, very different story. But none of that stuff got out. It was all the gases that, that were vented out and the water. Well, at that point, there was a movie showing in the United States called The China Syndrome. And movies, let's face it, movies bear as much resemblance to reality as military music does to music. I mean, it really doesn't. It really doesn't. I mean, they're fine, they're entertaining. You know, they don't, they don't tell things as they are. And the, the, the premise of this China Syndrome was that a reactor would undergo one of these lots of coolant accidents and would literally burn down, going all the way through the Earth's crust and end up in China. I don't have to tell you that doesn't happen, at least I hope it doesn't, because right now the Chinese are building one nuclear power plant every three months. So if anything, the stuff will be coming the other way. <laughs> but it doesn't happen, that's, that's physically impossible. In fact, for most of these things, the pressure vessel, the, the reactor containment system, works exactly as designed as it did in this case. The only problem is because the people were asleep at the switch, they didn't realize that they were venting both uh, water and, and radioactive gas. But nobody was killed. There's been no excess mortality, no excess cases of cancer, as far as anyone can determine. But what happened? Right about Chernobyl, I'm oh, sorry, right about Three Nile Island, 1979, the Americans quit building reactors. There has not been a single reactor commissioned in the United States since 1979. Besides, everybody went, Ooh, we're doomed. And yet nobody died. Nothing happened. Okay, the power company. Metropolitan Edison lost a huge amount of money because they spent billions building one of these reactors and they went and cooked it, they went and broke it. And so, you know, it wasn't particularly good for their shareholders. I'm sure some of their employees lost their jobs and, you know, the image of Homer Simpson with the, the little slug of uranium in his, in his pincers comes to mind. But the damage it did to the US nuclear industry was immense and it was all psychological. None of it was based on fact or any kind of dispassionate analysis of the risks. It was just, oh my god, the nuclear stuff is too dangerous. And of course, what did they do? They started building coal-fired power plants instead, which were many times worse. And they took the, they stopped designing, what's even worse, is they stopped designing new reactors. GE and Westinghouse, the two, two at that time, two of the biggest uh, reactor manufacturers in the world, they shipped, I mean, the stuff that they used in, in Fukushima, this year, 2011, was based on the same old Westinghouse boiling water reactor designs, which were basically dating from the 60s. Imagine if you were driving a 1960s car. 
They look very cool, they look great, but in terms of safety, <laughs> forget it. And they're death traps. These things were the equivalent. Roughly speaking, if any of the modern safety systems had been had, been, had existed in Fukushima, that, that accident probably would not have happened, despite a 9.0 earthquake and a 15 meter tsunami. But that's another story. Anyway, they stopped building. Then what happened? Everything's fine for a couple of years. Small time stuff, a bit of sort of fuel handling and reprocessing accidents. There was one in Germany, one in Switzerland, one in the UK and Scotland. But very small stuff. Nobody killed, nobody injured. You know, nobody, nothing worth getting upset about. And then came Chernobyl. Chernobyl is hard to describe without getting emotional, if you're anyway involved in nuclear physics or engineering. It is the worst, the most unforgivable, the most sloppy, the most base, the most vile. It was a combination of five or six different things, none of which should ever have happened. First of all, they had this design. This is what they call the RBMK design, the classic Soviet design at the time. Now, the Soviet Union had had plenty of nuclear accidents, but they never told anybody about them. And, you know, their population was considered extendable anyway, so unless you actually saw a huge sort of nuclear plume coming up, you never knew what was going on inside that, that benighted country. But their designs focused around graphite. And graphite is a terrible idea for two reasons. At least two reasons. First reason being that it's always there. You want the moderator to be there when the reaction is going. You want the moderator to be gone when the reactor is wants to shut down. Graphite is basically carbon. It's like pencil lead. It's like it's solid material. It's there whether you like it or not. So the only way of controlling this reaction is with the control rods, these boron or, or uh, essentially reaction poisoners, when you put them in so as to stop the reaction. But it takes a long time. It can take 20 seconds to roll these things down. And in the case of the Russians, it took a lot longer than that because they did lousy control rods. They built very bad control rods with graphite tips so that initially when you put them in, they actually increase the reaction. And then only when they were all the way down, the reaction starts to decrease. So graphite is a lousy idea for that reason, because you can't get rid of it when you need to. Unlike water, all you can do is stop pumping it or it flashes to steam and then it's gone. The second reason it's a lousy idea, if anything goes, does go wrong, it starts to burn. It's carbon, it's like coal. It starts to burn, and not only does it start to burn, but it breaks into tiny little particles of soot, like the finest dust that would blow all over the world because they'll be carried along by the winds. There's not a lot of gravity to pull them down. They just get blown on the, on, the, on the trade winds. And so anything that happens is going to end up dispersing everywhere. I mean, water, water is not ideal in some sense, because in, in Fukushima, for example, right now, there's, they're having to pour water continuously from outside because they didn't design their, their close systems properly. And that water, of course, floods over and it's radioactive. It's not hugely radioactive, but it's, it's, a, it's a bit hot. And it goes out to the sea. And of course it's diluted by being in the sea, but it's better that you not put the stuff into the sea, because like I said at the beginning, you own it. That's your radioactivity. What are you doing pouring it into the sea? You should be keeping it. You should be keeping it within the reactor vessel. Um, but water, at least, doesn't go spewing all over the world. Okay, the currents will carry some of it, and they can pick up, because they have such exquisite sensitivity in nuclear detectors, you can pick up a little tiny little uptick in California, and then people in California start going, oh, we're dead. <laughs> Despite the fact that, you know, they're, well, let's say they're living with a lot more risk from earthquakes than they are from, from stuff in, from, from Fukushima. But graphite actually does go around the world. I mean, when Chernobyl went off, it coated all of Western Europe and a lot of the Eastern Soviet Union with, with this radioactive, and this is not just the ordinary radioactivity, this is cooling water. This is part of the core itself. This is the most radioactive stuff. If you were standing next to this, you would get a fatal dose in about two seconds. You're talking about thousands of millisieverts per minute. And, and literally, right next to the core, you're probably talking about tens of sieverts per minute. So you'd be getting, yeah, you, 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 10 seconds you'd be cooked. And this stuff is going up. And of course, the Russians didn't believe in building containment vessels or sarcophaguses, you know, these big, uh, Concrete domes over the top. So whatever came out of the core just went up in the sky. But the first thing they did, this is an unstable design, because of the presence of the graphite and because of the bad fuel rod design. It's almost ready to go up. And paradoxically, it's most unstable when you run it at low power. Because the way they designed it is that the fuel rods and the control mechanism, the pumps, 
were run by the turbines themselves. When you're running the reactor at low power, the turbines are turning slowly. They're barely kicking over. They had diesel backups, but the diesel took about a minute to kick in. And sometimes a minute is not enough. Anyway, so bad reactor design, number one. Number two, bad crew. They had a crew that was ill-trained, that was poorly paid. I'm sure if, if anything like modern Ukraine is, is, is an example to go on, probably half of them were drunk. And I don't mean like slightly drunk, I mean paralytic. But this is the way life is there. It's a very unhealthy population. Um, the day crew, the expert crew, had designed an experiment. They were going to do a stability experiment on this, on this particular reactor. The experiment configuration called for it to run at a certain level, about 700 megawatt thermal. It was actually running at about 50. So it was, it was really ready to go on stable. It was run by the night crew instead of the day crew, the people who designed the experiment. The night crew didn't really know what was going on, but they were told to do certain things and they did them. When they did them, the reactor went unstable. An accident waiting to happen. Huge power spike. It went from about 50 megawatts to 30 gigawatts, almost a thousand fold increase in power output within a few minutes. They didn't know what to do. They tried to push the control rods in, but because the control rods had this design flaw, they had graphite tips instead of boron tips, they actually made things worse for a period of about 10 seconds. And then the, the core walked so much that they wouldn't go in any further. So they had a hot reactor. They had a huge spike in, in thermal output. They blew the lid off the thing. All the graphite, all the fuel rods, all the control rods went out basically into the night sky. Coated the whole area around it. The, the last student didn't know what was going on, but they, they knew it wasn't good. So they called a the fire brigade. They called the local fire service from the nearby city of Pripyat. Now the fire brigade in Pripyat had previously had nothing to do with Chernobyl. They didn't really know what was going on in there. They had, or rumors, of course, because of, this was the Soviet Union. But they didn't know what they were dealing with. So they come up with their water, their water sprays, and their sort of normal, you know, oil skins or whatever. No radiation suits. No, none of the special foam that you would use to try and keep the graphite from blowing. Graphite actually burns stronger in the presence of water than it does simply in the presence of air. The, the burning of graphite is more intense when it gets full of hydroxyl groups, and that's what water has. It's HOH, it's hydrogen hydroxide. And so things went, went worse. And of course, they were standing by hosing down this stuff that was giving them a fatal dose of radiation within 10 seconds, because it had come directly out of the core. So pretty much all the fire, the fire service, the people who were, who were uh, directly responding, were killed within a day or two. So that, that was 21 people. Um, some of the people who were reactor operators stayed behind to try and shut things down. Some of them died, and they had gotten you know, tens of secrets. They were, they were dead from the moment they, they got that exposure. The government in the meantime, remember this is the old Soviet Union, told nobody. They didn't evacuate, they didn't tell people not to drink the milk or eat the food, they didn't give out iodine tablets, they said nothing. So people continued ingesting the iodine, the cesium, the strontium. Worst possible case. I mean, compared to Fukushima, it's night, night and today. People are comparing Fukushima to Chernobyl, and I, I, I laugh at them. I, there's absolutely nothing in common between those two accidents, except the fact that they were involving nuclear reactors. Anyway, so Chernobyl, eventually, they send in <coughs> crews to drive bulldozers and put in some boric acid, which is a, a neutron poison in the same way as the control rods are, just to make sure the thing doesn't reignite. Um, bulldozed earth, concrete sarcophagus, the whole works, which kind of shut things down and, okay, there's still nuclear material in there, but it's not going anywhere. Uh, it's not leaching into the groundwater. But of course, the initial plume is now blowing all over the place. And they only disclosed it when a, a nuclear power station in Sweden, three days later, picked up the radiation plume traveling overhead and depositing some stuff. And they thought for a, day, for a while that it was them. It was their own power station. But they knew pretty quickly that it wasn't. And you can also tell by the ratios and the sort of mixtures of these things that are coming out, you know which country and probably even which power station they came out from, because each one is different. Anyway, that's Chernobyl. Chernobyl is a monstrosity. Never a doubt. But people still think Chernobyl every time they think of a nuclear plant. Well, yes, if you're back in the old Soviet Union in the 1980s with all these, with all these people and these ridiculous designs and these crazy procedures, yes, that, that's, that's what you get. But that's nothing to do with, with modern practice. After Chernobyl, things sort of calmed down for a while. 
Um, nobody wants to build reactors after that. Um, 25 years later, by the way, you can look back at Chernobyl, the flora and the fauna have come back. They had one generation of uh, horses and deer and whatever that looked stunted, sort of probably because they had thyroid problems from the first go around. But the second generation was fine. No sign of birth defects, no sign of any sort of obvious problems. Um, so 25 years later, the, the nature has pretty much come back. The town of Pripyat is still deserted. Nobody wants to live there. I'm not entirely surprised. But some of this stuff is very long-lived, and you, you, it's really not good for you. Um, on the other hand, the number, the number of deaths from Chernobyl, the worst possible combination of circumstances. It's hard to estimate, because as I said, this is a very unhealthy population anyway. They, they drink like crazy, they smoke like crazy. They are, I mean, the, the median sort of life expectancy in those places is probably less than 50 years. So you certainly can't use them as a sort of normal population for cancer statistics or or any of the sort of diseases that you would associate with radiation exposure. But a conservative estimate is that somewhere between eight and 10,000 excess cases of thyroid cancer resulted. Now that could mean nil cases of thyroid cancer if only they told people not to eat the food and drink the milk and gave them iodine tablets. But nonetheless, somewhere between eight and 10,000 cases. Thyroid cancer, thankfully, is relatively treatable. The statistics are within five years, 96% of the people who get it are alive, and even after 30 years, more than 90%. I mean, you know, most people, if they get decent medical care. No, we don't know if they got decent medical care, because this is the Ukraine. But if this happened in a Western environment, you would have more than, probably more than 95% uh, of the people would be alive having experienced thyroid cancer. So it wouldn't be ideal for them. They would have, have to go through chemotherapy and, and surgery. But nonetheless, the, the odds of survival were very good. So somewhere around a twentieth of that number, so you're talking about maybe a few hundred people probably died as a result of excess uh, exposure in Chernobyl. And it's bad, you know, a few hundred people being killed is not, not good. But it's the equivalent of one airplane falling out of the sky. So it's a tragedy, but it certainly isn't the reason to shut down an entire industry and, and, and turn your face against a, a particular form of power generation. Particularly considering the millions of people who die every year as a result of, of burning fossil fuels, and then never mind mining the stuff. God knows how many people die in Chinese mines. 